This is the Mark Dolan Way. Top tips for mind, body and soul, some great life hacks and my favourite products of the week. This show is available on all podcast platforms or you can watch it. Just subscribe to the Mark Dolan Way on YouTube and join the Facebook group. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the show. I hope you are very well. I hope you've had a good week. Um, I've had a dramatic week. I took a road trip, which I always love to do. I'm so comfortable in a car and the longer the trip, the better. So I find 25 minutes in a car just annoying, but seven hours, happy days. Um, I always take a big old, massive, gigantic mug of coffee with me and snacks and treats and great music. I've got all my entertainment sorted out. Breaks on the way, pop into a service station, have a wee, buy more treats. I love it. I love a road trip. You've got to enjoy it. Actually, a brilliant new hack for road trips, which I mean, might strike you as obvious, but I've never done it before. I was traveling with my son and um, we had music all the way and that was lovely. And um, the thing that we do there is that I choose a song. He he controls the phone because I'm driving. So he's got the phone in his hand and he'll say, OK, what song do you want? And I will just have a think of all the songs in the world. And then he will I will tell him what I want and he plays it. And then it's his turn and he plays a song and then it's back to me. And we take it in turns to choose the songs. It's quite exhausting, actually. But what's nice is that while the song's playing, whilst your friend's song is playing, then you'll be thinking about what song you're going to get next. And you've got lots of options. It's quite exciting. And I've done this in a group of four at Christmas. We had a four person road trip. So it'd be like person A, person B, person C, person D, back to person A. It was a long trip, maybe an hour and a half. So we got through a lot of songs and so many of the songs requested by the others were, were good that I put them on a playlist for myself because there's nothing better than having people recommend music to you. The problem you've got is there's just unlimited amount of music out there. And where do you start? You always go back to your favourite stuff, don't you? So it's lovely if you're forced to listen to someone else's music because then you're like, no, nah, actually, I quite like that. I remember I was out running a few years ago and I bumped into this lovely guy, a kind of an old friend uh, in the street. And we got a bit of chatting and then I was like, OK, I'm in the middle of my run, so I'm going to carry on running. He said, oh, by the way, um, I can really recommend uh, John Mayall, M-A-Y-A-L-L. Uh, he's really good. I don't know why he mentioned it, but he just mentioned, I think maybe he was listening to one of his records or something. And I went, oh, thanks for the recommendation. I said goodbye to this guy. And then I simply put John Mayle into Apple Music and I played it. So in the middle of my run, this guy's recommended an artist I've never heard of before, never listened to. And I've become a huge fan, a real kind of blues legend, great guitar player, great singer, great songwriter, John Mayle. Happy days. Um, so it's always good to be open to suggestions and recommendations of films and books and music. Just, you know, take take people's recommendations. And a lot of the time you're like, God, that was awful. But a lot of the time it'll be a game changer for you because the people that you like, your friends have a connection with you. And therefore, if there's stuff they like, there's a good chance that you will like it, too. Because in a way you have a kind of shared intellectual and creative DNA. I would have thought. Because um, you'll know that when you've got a friend whose judgment you really trust. You're like, oh, so-and-so recommends that band. I'm going to go and do it. Uh, or they recommend that restaurant. They know what you'll like because they're a bit like you. So we did the road trip and that was very nice. Oh, yeah. Very good trick on the way back. We were kind of tired and not really in the mood to be choosing music. And so I thought, wait a minute, why don't we listen to some TV shows? Because, of course, with your phone, you can stream television. And we just simply plug the phone into the sound system of the car. So we listened Well, he watched and I listened to two episodes of the hilarious sitcom Curb Your Enthusiasm. 
And it was very funny. It was very entertaining. It was a great thing. And it flew by. So that's an hour gone. Two episodes of Curb. I think it was at least two. I think it was two, not three. I think we listened to two. And then we went for the BBC business programme, Dragon's Den, in which budding entrepreneurs pitch their idea to four successful business people. And in return for a chunk of the company and some in return for the, a chunk of the company, they get investment from from the uh, from the entrepreneurs, from the dragons. It's a very good show, very combative. If you don't have the BBC, because this programme is very international, um, a lot of it is on YouTube, Dragon's Den. I can highly recommend it. I'm sure there are international versions of the same show. And think, I think there are, in fact. So Dragon's Den, very good. So we listened to about two or three episodes of Dragon's Den. And, that, and honestly, that was like most of the trip just taken up with something stimulating, a bit of a few laughs from Curb Your Enthusiasm and then a little bit of stimulation from Dragon's Den. I do like documentaries and I do like shows, reality shows like Dragon's Den because you get to use your brain, don't you? Because you're analysing human nature and of course you're evaluating the merits or otherwise of this business idea. So I do love that. I like documentaries. I like anything real because I just think that it gives you something. I could watch grand designs in which people have a plot of land or a completely derelict house and then they spend months transforming it. And because it's not actors and it's not scripted, it's real life. On that show, Grand Designs, very often, brackets almost always, they run out of money before the project has finished. And so you see human beings on the edge you know, it's not easy. It's hard. It's a struggle. And it's great to see that, that human journey. And also watch the architectural issues with the building, the engineering problems. The roof's just fallen in. It's raining outside. The, the, the local planning officer has said no. Fascinating. So I like real telly, uh, documentary films. I think there's always something to take away. I just think drama, it's great escapism, but it's constructed. It's not real. And I just don't find it leaves me with as much as I would like. Now, by the way, I think I'm showing my age because I think when I was younger, I used to enjoy the escapism of drama. But now I just want information. And any documentary is by definition information, isn't it? Um, so yeah, that's that. I mean, of course, there are dramas about real life events, which is nearly as good as a documentary, and that's not too bad at all. Um, a massive hit in the UK has been a program, a drama about what's been called the post office scandal. And essentially, the the uh, software installed at post offices around the country was provided by a Japanese IT firm called Fujitsu, who you might have heard of, massive company. And the the, the software that these that the people running the post offices uh, that was installed, the software they were using that was was um, connected to, well, it was accounting software. So the software provided by the post office was faulty and what it would do is you'd have your local post office often in a charming little village where the post office doubles up as a little bakery or a deli or a cafe run by charming British people doing their best serving their community and they would do their accounting at the end of the day And the computer would say, oh, you're uh, you're uh, you're minus two and a half thousand pounds. There's a two and a half thousand pound discrepancy on your accounts. So what it would essentially do that the software has taken a log supposedly of the amount of money that's come in that day, the takings, the deposits, whatever it is, the transactions. And it's saying, well, wait a minute, your figures don't add up and you're two thousand pounds out rather than just 0, 0.00 because if the accounting was correct it would you'd put your figures in and it would go yeah no discrepancy discrepancy is zero the takings 12000 pounds 
discrepancy zero. But no is offering a discrepancy of, of a couple of thousand pounds or 10,000 pounds, 20,000 pounds. Anyway, it was uniquely uh, wrong. And lots of people were having this problem. But when they called the post office helpline, the people, because the way that the post office works is that you have these sub postmasters. And so they run the post office as a little independent business, like a franchise. And it's got all the post office branding. The post office is the big parent company. But individuals would have a license, would have the right, the lease, whatever you want to call it, to actually run a local post office. So they were not direct employees of the post office. They're sort of they're sub postmasters and you know, sub contractors, basically. And they would call the post office helpline, the central office and say, look, it says here that I'm two thousand pounds out, but I, that can't be right. And it doesn't make sense. And the post office advice person would say, oh, type in this code and let's see if that helps. And then it would suddenly say the discrepancy is, is four thousand pounds. It's like make it even worse. And people were absolutely desperate. They didn't want to be um, labelled thieves or criminals. So quite often they would dip into their savings or use credit cards or borrow money to make up the discrepancy that wasn't their fault. It was it was wrong software. It was faulty software. And what was evil about the post office management is that they were aware of issues with the Horizon software. But they were not open about that. And they, I don't know, really, I mean, it's hard to know what motivated them. That they, they were either in denial and like ostriches had their head in the sand or they were lying and being corrupt. Or was it a mixture of the two? But anyway, it's been a complete scandal because what happened is people went bankrupt. Uh, people wound up going to court. They were accused of stealing very often that that uh, accusation was upheld and they would go to jail. Their reputations were destroyed. I interviewed a woman who was spat at by locals in her town because she was um, understood to be a thief. And it was so bad that she had to quickly sell her house at a much lower price and leave the town. Turns out she's completely innocent. It was this dodgy software. And... So it's been described as the biggest miscarriage of justice in British history because over 700 sub postmasters were involved. They went through hell. They thought they were mad. They were accused of being criminals. Marriages ended. A few of the people took their own lives. Can you believe that? So the post office have blood on their hands, quite literally, as well as damage to people. Uh, health problems. People had to retire early. Anxiety, stress, depression. Um, and it still hasn't been resolved. I mean, it's now clear what was going on. And there's the process of compensation, which will reach over a billion pounds eventually once it's all paid out. But it won't bring back the people that killed themselves and it won't undo the damage. I spoke to another woman who essentially lost 20 years of her life over this issue. Can you believe it? So bad. So... Uh, but yeah, so that's an example of real telly. That was a drama, but based on a true story. And that's the kind of thing I like. I think real stuff is good. And I think that's the kind of thing that you could be on the lookout for. Is documentaries, obviously podcasts, where people talk about their life, their, their life experience. Autobiographies are very good. Books about people's lives. Biographies are even better because biographies are written by sort of a journalist or author with a bit of critical judgment who will look at somebody that they're writing a book about and then offer, you know, a little bit of scrutiny about their life, their career, their legacy. Sometimes autobiographies, which is when you write a book about yourself, can be a bit self-praising. So certainly political autobiographies are often rubbish because it's just, oh, I did the right thing and that war was a good idea and I was really clever with what I did with the economy and there's like a lot of self-aggrandizement. But biographies about politicians are very good because that's somebody that evaluates their legacy as well as telling their story. But yeah, so the older I get, non-fiction, I think it's the way to go. Documentaries, non-fiction books and dramas based on a true story like the post office scandal. 
if you can find that anywhere, if you're listening to this outside of the UK, um, do see if you can. It's on ITV. I don't know whether they let you stream it abroad. They do have a streaming platform called ITVX. You might be able to tap into that, perhaps get a free trial. I'm a big fan of that, by the way. Let's say Disney Plus or Apple TV or Prime are carrying a great series. Get the free one month trial. Put the renewal date into your diary, make a reminder and then just cancel it before that first month comes to an end. And you get a load of free TV. It's not bad. And if you're loving it, then you stay. What's not to like? So, yeah, so I was on the road trip and uh, that was really nice to listen to a bit of TV on the way back. And I might do that more. But let me tell you that you've got to be so careful because if you're driving, you cannot have TV on your phone, even if it's in a holster. You can't be driving along with a TV show just there playing on your phone. So probably what needs to happen is that you have the phone if you're on your own, you've got the phone next to you on the seat face down or with the screen blacked out and you're just listening to the audio and you don't touch or control the phone whilst you're driving. I know that's a very boring thing to say, but, you know, I feel I have a duty of care to give correct above the board and proper advice. I've got your back. Let's be honest. So there you go. Um, now, a few things. First of all, a bit of persistence and never giving up. My motorbike has got a little horn on it. And when you ride a motorbike, it's a very important safety feature. The horn, the uh, the hooter, beep, beep, the bib. I think we call it the bib in, in this country, don't we? The bib. I think I might have used to call it the bib anyway. But the horn, I think, might be the universal word to describe that little button on your in your car or on your motorbike that makes a noise on a bicycle it's a bell so I've got a horn on my motorbike and I really can't tell you how important it is because the majority of accidents involving motorbikes the car involved will always say I didn't see him I didn't see her they always say that about bicycles and motorbikes drivers don't see you which is why you must wear a bright yellow high vis I also drive my motorbike in full beam because I can be seen more brightly. And what else do I do? Oh, yeah. So I hoot the horn. So I'm like, beep, beep. So if, I, if I'm driving along and I can see a car just like sort of edging out from a side road, I like beep, beep, just so he can hear me. And therefore, I've made my presence felt. Well, anyway, the bike horn just stopped working. It just went silent. It lost its voice. And I was just riding to the supermarket earlier today. It's on a bit of a big road and flying along. And I tried it again. It was silent. I don't know why, but I, I, I somehow just like was didn't notice. But I just I had my finger on it nonstop. I just kept pressing it. Nothing was happening. And then I, I kind of was an autopilot. I, I somehow wasn't even focusing on the horn. I was just tapping away at this thing, which was making no sound. It was very unconscious. And then suddenly I got a little like that little and made a little noise and I carried on hammering and then it got louder and louder and it kind of like cleared its throat and it came back. But it was a good reminder that you just need to be persistent. And probably what I should have done is I should have been persistent in the first place. It wasn't working. It's was like, just keep hammering it and eventually something will happen. And it did and had a very similar experience on a, I took a bit of an open day to a university and I was with someone else and we were walking around. We were checking out this university for a friend. So I'm walking around this university and, uh, you know, they've got the library, which is really nice. And they've got the canteens and they've got the science block and the engineering block. And, and we went into uh, the engineering block and you know, little bits of it were open, bits of it were closed. We were unaccompanied, actually. But you know what university is like? You can just wander around. We didn't obviously weren't planning any criminal activity we were just wandering around so uh, and there were a few things a few rooms lit up you went in and look around like a lecture hall a couple of labs um, students were in some of them working away no problem uh, and then we got to like this we we're in this engineering block and the doors all seemed to be locked and I really wanted my friend to like see this this department because he's interested in engineering so yeah, we're walking along and it seems like, oh, that door's locked. And and the instinct would be, all right, 
it's all locked up. Let's um, let's go. Let's leave. But I'm quite persistent. And there were many doors in this engineering department. And I basically just tried each door. They were all locked. And then there was just one door at the end. And it was just not locked. It was unlocked. And we went into this amazing, massive lab. And it did that really cool thing where you open the door and it's dark. And then you walk past the sensor and then all the lights just flicker on. What a moment. And it was really great to get in there and look around. I didn't touch anything, obviously. didn't disturb anything. But we just, I mean, look, it was cheeky. But you know, this podcast is is about being, I mean, I often say, you, you know, you can be cheeky. I encourage you to be not illegal. Don't upset people or do anything bad, but a bit of cheeky. I think it's cheeky. So we were cheeky and we wander out. But it was only because, of, you know, anyone else would assume you're like, let's say there's three, let's say there's four doors and three of them are locked. Most people would be like, well, then the fourth is locked because you're like, well, if the other three are locked, that'll be locked. But I don't make those assumptions. So all the doors were locked except the one at the end, which looked like the other doors. And it was unlocked. I chanced my arm and in we went. And there's a good metaphor there. I think you'll agree. So that's it. Um, There was another example of that, of my persistence with these things. Um, But yeah, give stuff a try. And don't be defeatist. Check every door. There you go. That is the metaphor. Now, what else do I need to tell you? Um, Intensity, okay? I think there's two ways to live your life, which is drip drip or pulsatile. Now, what I mean by that is sort of drip drip, let's say you're working, is where you sort of go to the office and maybe it's an eight, nine hour shift and you sort of just zibbling along Um, consistently for the whole eight hours. Now, I don't think that's very productive. I don't think it suits our nature as creatures. And that would be the drip, drip approach. By the way, this is coming up with these weird expressions, drip, drip. But hopefully, you know, you know what I mean. It's like Chinese water torture. Sort of steady as she goes, like a conveyor belt, like a treadmill. That's not how I like to roll. I like the... um, I like the rather more intense approach. Okay, pulsatile. So what pulsatile means, a pulse is like, your pulse is just, isn't it? You hit a pulse like that. It's got a beat to it. Okay, and and therefore I like to work in a pulsatile way, which means, let's say I wake up in the morning and I just chew through a load of work, real intense, no break, only a wee, that's all you're allowed is a wee, but otherwise you just, you've had your coffee, you've had your breakfast, whatever it is, you're taking care of your physical needs and then you just grind it out. And then what you do is completely stop and you do nothing. And that is how I like to do it. So you work and you don't work and it's very pulsatile rather than the kind of dribbly day where you're sort of working for the whole day. It's kind of like 12 hours of just, I'm kind of working. You know, I don't think it's great. I think it's pulsatile. And you go right from two till four, I will do nothing else. My phone will be switched off and it will just be intense. Um, I think I might have got the appetite for this when I was at school and uni and doing exams because exams are pulsatile, aren't they? Because what happens is that you have two hours in which to just pour everything out of your head onto the page that you know. And then you stop. And I just like working that way. Imagine if exams were eight hours and it was just sort of, you know, you have a sandwich, then you do a bit more and then you have a nap and then you go back to it. That would be tortuous, wouldn't it? Exams are wonderfully intense. It's amazing how much work you get done in exam conditions. So why not create exam conditions for yourself? So at work, you've got your list of things to do. Just do it in a really focused and intense way with no breaks and then stop. And if you've got agency at work, if there's a bit of freedom, which I hope there is, you could leave work early because it's like, well, I worked in a very intense way and it's three o'clock in the afternoon and I'm all done. And you'd be like, yeah, Stephanie, she works in a very pulsatile way. You know, she just attacks it and then she's out of there rather than Bob who grinds it out all day long. Always popping off to like, you know, 
the staff canteen to make a cup of tea and he's gossiping. I mean, there's so much stuff at work that isn't work at all. How many minutes of the day are you actually working? So, yeah, I think that's a really great thing to do. To think of your life and your tasks in a pulsatile way. And it's the same with, you see this at the gym. People who go into the gym, they, sp they spend two hours in the gym. Now, look, some people love that. In fact, I've got a friend that disagrees with me and said look, that they like to take their time at the gym and enjoy the atmosphere and it being slow. But the number of people that don't really do much at the gym, you know, they just sit there on the machine. The machine is not a seat. It's not there for you to sit on. It's, it's for work. It's for exertion. You should use it for that. You get in, you smash your muscles, you get that hell out. Pulsatile, intense, just brilliant. And then you're gone. That's why when I when I was more of a runner, I used to love hills because it's a more concentrated form of running, isn't it? Uh, sometimes I go to Italy and there's a place where we stay and it's got a big hill up to the next town. There's one steady climb of about three miles. It's so satisfying. It's just uphill the whole way. You feel so good when you get to the top. And then when you're done, it's downhill all the way home. You're rewarded for your hard work. It's a beautiful thing. Um, we've lost the ability, haven't we, to uh, disagree with each other. Which is very frustrating. Uh, everything's tribal now. If you disagree with someone... Not only do you disagree, but they're a bad person. They're the enemy. And it's ridiculous because, you know, you need the competition of ideas and all opinions are valid. You know, extremism is, of course, a concern, but most people are not extreme. But they might be on one side or the other and they have to understand that you need both. So like politically, OK, you need the left and you need the right. And the high idea, the whole concept of democracy and of our history is that they compete um, for power. You have the left and then you have the right. And I don't think you would just put the left in charge forever. And I don't think you would put the right in charge forever. You need both. In an ideal world, you'd sort of probably have five years of left, five years of right. Or maybe it's 10 years of left, 10 years of right, whatever. But it's just... I think that we were, people were, were, were created um, to have certain instincts and certain qualities. And as a community, you've got all, all sorts, you know. And I think that it's probably in the hard drive, in the DNA, to a certain extent, that some people might be of a more left-leaning political instinct and others more of a, a right-leaning instinct. And... I think that's for a reason, which is you, you need both. And the, the concept of a better world is for those different philosophies to be competing with each other and for the strongest one to prevail every time. So what we need to do is we need to get back to that. We need to understand that you need both sides and that nobody has a monopoly on the truth. Nobody has a monopoly on the facts. Nobody has a monopoly on wisdom or the right ideas. And um, we need, we forgot that. And it's, if you think about it, it's very elementary. The idea that, that there should be the competition of ideas it has, you know, gone away because of tribalism. And it's about destroying uh, somebody, your opponent, who takes a different view to you. Well, that's ridiculous, isn't it? It's obviously been fermented and accelerated by the pandemic and people stuck on their phones for two and a half years. We know that social media companies make their money by making people cross and by making things tribal and by creating digital echo chambers. So it's like you're on X or Facebook or Instagram and it will offer you voices and opinions that are akin to the ones that you like. Well, that's not healthy, is it? Um, there's a magazine, a political magazine um, in the UK, and it's called The Spectator. I guess you could say it's more on the right. A very old magazine. It might be the, one of the, the oldest political periodical in the world or something. I mean, it's, good. it's a good age, well over 100 years old. A venerated thing. 
But there's a guy who's um top, well, he's an ex-pop star and a physicist, I think. Or, or at least he certainly knows about space. And that is Professor Brian Cox. He's a TV presenter as well. He's a great guy. And I think he's of the left politically. And the little quote for him on the Spectator website, and it says, I read, he said, I disagree with um, most of what I read in the Spectator. And that's why I read it. That's what he said. What a healthy and grown up thing to say. And we should all do that. We should expose ourselves to material and opinion and people and ideas that we don't agree with that are alien to us. It's really healthy. And it would be good for democracy, it'd be good for you. And in fact, you might learn something and you might find, surprisingly, that you do agree with stuff you thought you didn't agree with. So, yeah, basically, we all need to come together. You know, that is what we need to do. And embrace difference. And it's not just political, is it? Taste in food, taste in music, whatever it is. I mean, that's what we're always saying on this show. You get invited to the opera, right? And you're like, I'm not an opera person. I don't like the opera. You go. You literally, you go. So I don't like the opera and I'm going to the opera. And the reason why is because then when you get there, you're like, actually, I quite enjoyed it. Or I've started to get the appetite for it. I didn't like it at first, but now I do. Become the biggest opera fan ever. How often have you not liked somebody when you first knew them or worked with them? And then over time, a bond grows and suddenly they become a brilliant person, your favourite person, but you didn't like them at first. How many of those romantic comedy films involve a guy and a girl hating each other for the first third of the film? Oh, that guy, Steve, such a jerk. By the end, they're in love and they're getting married and all the rest of it. So that is uh, what you need to do. And there's another aspect to this, which I feel quite strongly about. And listen, I probably don't do it myself. I'm probably the biggest hypocrite. But I was talking to a friend um, who's a brilliant friend. And but this friend is always everything's a debate, right? Everything is a debate. So you could say, oh, I like I like oranges. And then the friend will sort of like disagree with you and say oranges are really bad for your teeth or I don't like the colour orange or they don't taste good or whatever but um, somehow everything is just a debate and it can be fun and it can be a little tiresome and I was talking to this friend because I'd been listening to an interview with Tony Robbins who is a very accomplished probably the world's leading self-help expert and he was talking about the um the way that you change your life and he talked about three elements and he's like you start with the body then you have the emotions and then you have habit so what he means by that is you fix your body so that means correct nutrition enough sleep not not drinking too much being drug free if you can so it's like uh, fitness of course exercise so you start with your body um, and then once you've done that then you look at your emotions negative emotions and positive emotions and um, Robbins is good because he talks about replacing negative emotions so for example if you've been fired right your emotion is very negative but then you can replace it with a feeling of well wait a minute I'm free now this is a big opportunity to go and find a job that I would actually love to do so you replace the negative emotion of being fired with a positive one which is about the opportunity that this has given you um, so do you see how you've just replaced that emotion? Or maybe a relationship comes to an end and you're sad. But then perhaps you just um, have, you know, you just accept that it's over. You understand it, it's not going to come back and you have peace with it. And so you've replaced anxiety with a sense of peace. It's like it's gone. I'm not happy it's gone, but it's gone. So you fix your body, then you fix your emotions, and then it's habits. And so that's what he talks about is the daily habits. Um, that you eliminate bad habits, such as picking your nose or being late or procrastinating, and replace it with good habits, such as a cold shower, being early, 
helping others, um, saving money, whatever it is. You know what? You've got your own idea of good habits. You've got your own idea of bad habits. So those are the three things. Now, that's his, his map. Body, then emotions, then habits. And I think he orders it that way because it sort of is logical that you get yourself physically well. And then you sort of tackle your emotional side. And then it's like the more practical stuff, which is, you know, your habits, which ties in with discipline and things. Anyway, I told this to the friend. And immediately the friend said, oh, well, uh, the emotions kind of in the body is the same. And essentially they just uh, wanted to debate and have some heated discussion about this. And I just thought, I'm just going to be really honest with you. I just thought, why can't, why can't I just tell you what, what this Anthony Robbins guy, what his idea is? He's, he's quite accomplished, you know, he's helped thousands of people. Can't I just tell you his thing? And can't you just go, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Why does it have to be a sort of intellectual joust, some battle. Now, look, don't get me wrong. I believe in the scrutiny of ideas. I mean, it's what I hopefully do for a living. And it's everything. It's what I said to you earlier, by the way, that you need the competition of ideas. I understand that. But I think there are also times when people can say something to you and it doesn't have to be a debate. It doesn't have to be an argument. You can just go, oh, OK. OK. You know, and I just think the world would be a lot better if we all had that moment every so often where we just where we yield to someone else's suggestion someone else's idea and go okay you know that's it and I think that would be a tremendous thing so I don't know somebody could just say well I don't like strawberry jam and I'll never have it and you just go okay all right you know that's it and I think our okay would be a bit of a superpower for all of us as we go about our lives people are different there's some stuff you're not going to change. You might not want to change some aspects of people. Them being different from you is fun and interesting. And thinking different things. And you can respond with, uh, yeah, okay, you think. So, you know, I mean, let's let's take the, I mean, there's a war at the moment. I, do, I know so little about the war in Ukraine, OK? <laughs> it strikes me that Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine and that was a bad thing to do because I, I think invading countries, you definitely already, uh, you've lost the moral high ground there, haven't you? So it, it, I think it's bad. And I feel very sorry for the people of Ukraine and, of course, for the Russian soldiers fighting that war. But I know a couple of people who somehow are like sympathetic to Russia, even sympathetic to their leader, its leader. And and I'm not, but there's two things. One, I don't know the detail out there. I don't know the history. I don't know the background. And also you're allowed to take that different view. You know, that, that particular conflict seems of a strong, strong idea that it's bad and it looks to me on the face of it bad okay but I know a couple of people who are somehow I don't think they're like sort of great cheerleaders of Russia but they're they're questioning whether the West should be involved and da, da, da. honestly I don't have skin in this game but I've spoken to a couple of people you know and 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 you know one or two of them have uh you know un un um, conventional view on it and my response is, OK, you know, that's fair enough. But we live in a world now where unless it's just Russia bad, Ukraine good, then you're a bad person, you're a monster and you should be shouted down. And well, no, I mean, like another good example would be the pandemic. And I, from from what I've read, from the data I've looked at, from the experts I've listened to on both sides, uh, it's my view that lockdowns were a catastrophic mistake, an experiment that palpably failed to stop this virus and caused great, great damage in the process. And I'm, it's all on record. You won't struggle to find videos of online from my TV show talking about it, about what a mistake it is. Um, 
but you know i know people i've just only a little while ago someone said well you know lockdowns they stopped the virus flattened the curve and saved millions of lives i don't think that stacks up but when they said that do you know what my response was i just went oh okay yeah you think that the lockdowns were brilliant and essential and we should do them again and maybe we shouldn't we should have done them quicker than we did in the first time all stuff i don't think and my attitude is, oh, OK, you know, because you know why they might be right and I might be wrong. But it would be very useful for all of us once a day, minimum, to just hear something we don't agree with and say, oh, OK, OK, try it this week. Just go go about your life and hear something that you think is outrageous, such as, um, I don't know, I'm going to put sugar on my... Um, I'm going to put sugar on my boiled egg. Okay. I mean, I've I've uh, sort of an in-law who went absolutely insane with anger when I had mayonnaise with so kind of a, a schnitzel, you know, the Wiener schnitzel thing. And it comes in Austria and Germany. It comes with uh, this jam, this lovely sort of it's a bit like cranberry sauce, but it's prizel bear. I don't know what that is. Prizel bear jam. But it's a lovely kind of red berry jam. It's sweet. And you have that with the meat, with boiled potatoes, sauerkraut, and then this lovely Wiener schnitzel. What is a Wiener schnitzel? It's basically a sort of slice of either chicken or pork. And then it's in, it's kind of breaded and fried and it's crispy and delicious. And I just went and got some mayonnaise and had it with mayonnaise. And, and the person I was with was absolutely furious that I had it with mayonnaise. Because you just, you don't do that. It's not, it's not, it's not what you do. Well, it's what I do. And I think it's, it works really well and tastes great. And that person, they needed just, they needed those vibes. They needed to just go mayonnaise with the, uh, with the schnitzel. Oh, okay. And I promise you, if you're a bit more are OK in your life, I think you'll make friends. I think you'll keep more friends. And I think you'll be popular and a good person to be around because it's like, oh, there you go. There's, there's Steve. He goes with the flow. You know what I mean? I'm a big Tottenham fan. Our great enemy team is Arsenal. I mean, Arsenal fan. Who do you support Arsenal? I'm like, oh, OK. You know what I mean? I'm not going to be cross with them about it. It's, it's football, you silly sausage. But I think it would be a great thing. Ah, uh, OK. Right. Listen, how are we doing? Blimey, where does the time go? I can't believe it. Uh, lots to get through in the next show. But uh, yeah, that's it. Expose yourself to alternative views, alternative material, stuff you don't like. Um, if you don't like horror films, go and watch a horror film. Um, if you hate ha fantasy books like Harry Potter or something, go and go and read it. Um, just and then, by the way, it may still be confirmed that you don't like it and you're never going to. That's fine. But give stuff a try. Come out of your comfort zone. Embrace discomfort. Embrace otherness. Immerse yourself in otherness. That's why traveling is good, because it's different cultures that are not your culture. It's a tremendous thing. Um, it's been great to chat. Go and have a great week and I will see you in a week's time. Lots of love. Oh, by the way, I should say this. This episode has dropped late and that's my bad. It was a very busy week and my systems failed. My systems failed. So I don't think this is going out until something like a Monday or a Tuesday. And that's very naughty. So I shall make every effort for Sunday to be the day that the pod drops but we did, we dropped the ball on this occasion. But yeah, so um, have a great week and you will, should be hearing the next podcast on Sunday. So this drops on a Monday or Tuesday, Sunday. And we'll get back to the regular Sundays from there on in. Um, have a great week. Stay awesome. Uh, please like, subscribe and tell your friends and please give me an honest review and I'll see you in a week. Go crazy and be lucky. Bye bye. <laughs>